Hello, welcome to the show. This is Minneapolis Expression. My name is Brandon Fertig, and today, obviously, we have a few more guests on than usual. We've got a panel, and we're going to have a little roundtable discussion. I actually hold these discussions once a week, every Sunday night, but this time I thought we'd get it on TV. We're not experts, per se, in the fields that we talk about, but what we are are four people that like to discuss things and have our ideas begin to flow from conversation. So I hope you at home enjoy our conversation today. Please introduce yourselves. I'm uh, Nick Ludwig. Nick? I'm Mark Johnson. Mark? Cammy Johnson. Cammy and Mark. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Nick, thanks a lot for being today, uh, guest today on the show. Okay, the topic that I wanted to talk about with uh, my weekly discussion group was the topic of foreign policy. We rebuilt Japan and then we've had a, a base there since. Same with Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, after Reconstruction, would you see it fit that we maintain a base there? Beyond uh, what's necessary to reconstruct the nation, I probably not. Why do you think they keep a base there? Well, y you've got soldiers employed, uh, working professional soldiers. Mm -hmm. But is it just a case of employment? Well, if there's no use, if there's no use for them to reconstruct anything else after after the damage we've done, um, I can't see any other reason to leave them there other than to, uh, you know, make sure they're employed. That seems to me the only justification. Good question. Whether the that was the end goal, to establish bases in other countries. The, the whole reason for warring. You know, back to the original question, do you, do you see a, you know, an overall benefit for a think, continued yeah. presence in Germany? I don't think most people think about it. That you're right, they don't. And they don't think about it. That's why we're doing this on this they show. They don't know about all the bases. <laughs> well, if we're going to have a global empire, we need to have soldiers around the world. Is it about the, you know, we've got the wealth, we've got the high standard of living to maintain, or to, you know, I mean, it's not well, like we're, we're, we're trying to, you know, maintain some artificially high standard, of, although maybe there's an argument for that, too. Uh, my point is, is that, you know, the globe is the globe. There's only so many trees. There's only so much food. Resources. There's only so many resources. Uh, is our, you know, do you think our, 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 our empire, our military presence in these foreign lands is our way of making sure we get our piece of the pie? Hmm. Well, I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to reject the whole premise of your Good. argument. Good. Uh, Please. Which is that, that it's just not true that there's only limited resources. We, all, we know for a fact that the more uh, people that uh, get into productive um, types of occupations, they they add wealth, they add resources to the globe. Now, some could say that, well, how could that be? The globe is is finite. Mm -hmm. It's true, but there's so much that we have not even begun to even uh, dig out of the ground, pump out of the ground, and besides all the the uh, renewable resources like trees and uh, agriculture and so forth, the more people you have doing productive things, the more wealth there is. So it might be the case that uh, some people think that, well, we need to grab other people's stuff mm -hmm. because uh, if, if we don't get it, then, uh, then they'll have it. But uh, I think that we know a little bit better than that, that that just doesn't even, that doesn't work. Historically, why people do that, or why nations do it, why why governments do it, is is for control, and it's uh, to uh, frankly it is to either um, uh, derive some sort of economic benefit, like you said, or it can be some other kind of benefit, a political benefit. Perhaps it all does come back to the money, but there are shorter term reasons why governments do things there. For example, our government nowadays and other Western governments is, is one of their goals is to try to prevent other countries from having nuclear weapons, right? Mm -hmm. right. And their reason for that is that, ostensibly, that uh, what nuclear weapons are a bad thing. Of course, not for the people that already have them, only for people that don't have them. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that governments do is to uh, try to persuade people or to, uh, to try to scare them or threaten them 
that uh, you know you're going to be in big trouble if you get nukes, uh, because only we can have nukes. And so that's uh, one of the one of the short-term things I think that governments do, and and maybe their reason is, or at least the reason that they tell their populations are, is that uh, these are dangerous. We're we can be trusted with nuclear weapons, but not those. North Koreans or those Iranians. When they do sanctions in Iran or on Iran, you know, they always talk about more sanctions for their continued uranium development. What does that mean? Well, again, I'm not sure of all the details, but they're generally they're economic sanctions and they're... Uh, do we find them? Uh, well, we, we just don't allow trade. I mean, a lot of trade <laughs> okay. with Iran is just plainly illegal. In other words, you're, it's against the law. You can go to jail for actually trying to have peaceful economic commerce with some of these nations like Iran. And words, by nation, do you mean just some company in Iran? Yes, with anybody in Iran. Huh. So, uh, and, the, and the, the purpose of this, or the supposed purpose of this, is that this is supposed to put pressure on the uh -huh. government because then the people or the businesses will, will whine at their government and say, you know, we can't make any money, we can't trade with uh, people in the United States would you stop making the United States angry so that they'll drop the sanctions and then we can trade? Whether that really works or not is, is um, it's doubtful that it's ever really worked very well. Most people will, will do one of two things. They'll either find different trading partners, which is what has happened in the Middle East, is that if we don't trade with them, they find other people to trade with. Um, and and that, whether that's Russia or China or Europe or whoever it happens to be. The second thing that happens is that if we don't trade with them, then we, we lose the uh, advantage of actually building kinds of relationships with them. And then, of course, that means that they just have more of an opportunity to become angry, hostile. Uh, we don't, if we don't have any, re any peaceful relationships with them, it's hard to actually develop or, or, or to actually develop sort of a, a cooling off of our, of our relationships between our two countries because, because we're not trading. Do you know if that would technically involve individuals? What do you mean? Like, what if my company can't trade with this guy's company because he's an Iranian and I'm an American, but what if individuals, like eBay, does it get that? It's, as far as I understand, it's illegal regardless. Now, of course, uh, you know, they, these laws are rarely, economic sanction laws are rarely enforced 100% because mm -hmm. it's too difficult. It's, mm -hmm. uh, we all know that if, the, if, you, if you don't have a legal market, you have a black market and people will trade regardless of whether it's legal or not. Yeah. But certainly what, the, what I think our government tries to do is they'll they'll look at bigger players, who they're easier to find, easier to track, yeah. and uh, and they will make sure that they don't have any kind of economic uh, relationships with these countries. Okay, that's why I can get a Cuban cigar if I really want one. I suppose <laughs> I've heard that that's true, but I've never tried it. You, you look at like the history of us in the central in, in Central America, our involvement with um, the Iron Curtain. If we don't fight, if we don't you know, will, will the perceived threat that initiated the involvement actually come to fruition? Is there a perceived threat there? Well, well, well of course there's a perceived threat there. I think what is you're trying to say, threat, is there a real threat? Is there a real threat there? Yes. And that's really questionable, isn't it? I mean, no, nobody knows for sure until it happens, right? But, but I do think that history helps us here. Most wars don't start from a vacuum. They, <clears throat> and maybe all of them. I, I'm trying to think of a war where somebody was surprised. I mean, we, we talk about how we were surprised by Pearl Harbor. Well, of course, that's just not true. We knew that the Japanese were going to attack us. It was just a question of when. It had been building up for years. And largely, to, to some degree, you could argue that due to our economic sanctions of Japan. Uh -huh. uh, the World Trade Center, was that out of the blue also? And I would argue no. Of course, we, we've had other terrorist attacks before then. It's not the first time the World Trade Center was uh, bombed. 